all these layers of parts of us. And so and many of these parts have lost connection, lost faith in those core qualities. So that really is why I'm pioneering this practice of self-fidelity. It's really about the restoration of faith in who we really are, the reconnection and trust in these innate qualities, so that these are the qualities that help us to activate our highest potential. And these are the qualities of true leadership. I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. This conversation with Cassandra Goodman was recorded live a few weeks ago on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn you will notice that it was a live conversation because it's a bit noisier than most of my episodes. I hope you don't mind. Cassandra is a wealth of knowledge about leadership, being authentic to yourself and being your best self at work. She has two amazing books that I really enjoy gifting my clients. And I hope that you really enjoy this conversation and take a lot of notes from it, as I often do when I catch up with her. I also have my group coaching program open for enrollments until the 10th of March. If you're watching this in February and early March 2023, I would love you to learn more about the group coaching program and enroll if you're ready for another job as soon as possible in 2023. If you're listening to this later, you can join the wait list and join me next time I open enrollments. I don't do it very often. So this is an amazing opportunity and I hope to see some of you there with me in this amazing community of professionals looking for their future and planning ahead, being really intentional about where they're taking their careers. If you have any questions, all you need to do is look at the description notes under this podcast episode, find my contact details and get in touch. I'd love to speak to you to see if you're a good fit for the program. If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you are a good fit for the program. All right, let's listen to my conversation with Cassandra Goodman. I hope you enjoy. All right, Cassie, we are live. If you're watching us, thank you for joining us today. We're playing live on my Facebook page, Renata Bernardi, on LinkedIn. I think both Cassandra's LinkedIn profile and my profile will be showing you this and also on YouTube on the Job Hunting Podcast channel. So go check it out. Choose where you want to watch as I have here Cassandra Goodman, who is a good friend of mine, who is the founder of the Center of Self-Fidelity, as you can read below, because now this live stream has branding and titles, and I'm really in love with that. Cassie has written two amazing books. The first one made me cry, made me love it so much. It's here, Self-Fidelity. She's going to explain what Self-Fidelity is, if you don't know, and you probably don't if you haven't read the book. And then her second book was just launched late last year, Being True. I bought many copies of this. Every client of mine gets one, and I'll explain why in a minute. And Cassie's work is really about being, sorry, Cassie, I will say a few things first and that, and then I'll let you talk. But I just want to make a proper introduction because I'm so excited. It's all about being true to yourself at work and during job hunting. It's even a trickier business. We're going to dive into that in a minute. But she helps leaders to become who they want to become. And, you know, she believes that being true to your deep selves will liberate you to achieve your high potentials. And I was thinking about it so much this week as I was preparing for this interview and thinking that I wish some of my clients are listening to this because there are some that are still being challenged or some. So many of us are challenged with that self-awareness. And I want to say a little bio from Cassie before we start our conversation. She has over three decades of doing a business 
business and working in the corporate sector in senior leadership roles, including when she was global director of employee experience at Bupa, and she was accountable for the well-being of over 86,000 employees around the world. She's also an accredited coach and an expert facilitator and speaker, trainer and consultant. Cassie has provided us with very popular and much loved masterclasses inside my group coaching program. And it has made a huge impact on my clients that have watched it over the past couple of years. And she has worked with many organizations both in Australia and overseas, including Zoom, NBN, Adobe, Origin, Energy Australia, and so on. So you can go to her LinkedIn profile later and read more about her. Please follow Cassie. She posts regularly on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and you know her posts are really inspiring and motivational. So if you're seeking a new job and you're interested in career advancement, personal development, professional development, Cassie is certainly one to follow. Did I do you justice? How was that? Thank you, Renata. I wish we had time for me to reciprocate with all the fabulous things you do in the world, but I think your community knows you well and all the amazing work you do in this crucial chapter between jobs to figure out who the hell we really are and how we find a career that really activates that. So thank you. I'm honoured to be here. I'm really honored to call you a good friend and you've been such a big fan of my work. I still remember when you read my first book, Self Fidelity, and you called me and said, it's actually a really good book. You're an excellent writer. Your writing style is just so easy to read. And I say this with all due respect, you know, it's important concepts that you have thought about it and you have ruminated and you spit it out in a way that makes total sense for people that are in a hurry to learn. And then with this second book, I think what you're asking people to do is to step down from the race and take time and use some of the tools that you're suggesting. I loved the tools. I'm all about tools. But before we dive into the book itself, I want to ask you this, okay, because I've been thinking about it for a couple of weeks Job hunters are usually very ready to please others, right? Mm -hmm. Either they have lost their jobs and they're currently out of work or they don't like their jobs, which is apparently most of the population of, you know, in the corporate world today. If you look at all of the research that has been done last year and this year, you know, it's between 50 to 80 percent of everybody employed wants to change jobs. (laughs) And, you yeah. know, they want to be in a better organization. And for that reason, they seek culture and they seek fit. But when they go for job interviews and they're really keen to get a job, they're easily conformist. So they want to conform. Yes. They want to fit in. They worry about what the people think. They're competing for an opportunity. There are mm-hmm. others that are competing with them. So how do you deal with that, Cassie? What would be your advice for my listeners? What incredibly important questions, Renata. I can tell you, you thought deeply and everything you've said is absolutely true, right? So we all have these parts of ourselves that want to conform, want to please, want to fit in, because that's what we've been told forever, right? Good leaders or good employees fit in. We don't stand out because that would be inconvenient. We fit in. And so absolutely... I think the first thing that comes to mind as you talk about this really tricky situation of how do we stay true to ourselves in an interview situation, the first thing that comes to mind is to bring this really strong awareness of the part of you that really wants to fit in, that really wants to conform, to say and do whatever it takes to get that job. You know, you want to put 10 burning hoops in front of me? I'll jump through all 10 hoops and do somersaults on the way if you just please give me this job right we've all been there right so I think the first thing is bringing awareness to that part of you I mean I call that part of me my little miss achiever who spent decades believing that she could somehow achieve her way to this elusive destination of Worthyville finally feeling like she was enough in the world right so one I would say 
bring an awareness. Oh, okay, this part of me, I can sense that I'm trying to say the right thing. I can sense that I'm doing all this research so that I can mold myself, put on these masks that I'm just going to be like this chameleon. I'm going to come in and just completely blend in. Yes. <laughs> you won't even know I'm here, you know. Yes. So bringing that awareness that we're conditioned to do that. It's normal to have parts of us that want to do this, but also knowing that ultimately when we do this, we're only skimming the surface of our potential. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second, the context here, of course, is it depends a lot on your financial context and the job you're going for. If you're a single parent and your household relies on your income and your dream job happens to be in an organization with a really controlling CEO who demands compliance to keep a job, then of course, we're going to do what we need to do to feed our family. I'm a mom of two kids. I get the reality, right? So, mm -hmm. so I don't want to take this kind of Pollyanna view. Let's be true to ourselves and everything will be fine. It's not that simple, right? So everything I share today is really in that context of what is the risk we're taking in showing up as our authentic, imperfect selves? How big is that risk really? What would be the implications of us being, you know, spat out by an organizational system that happens to be led by people who demand conformity? And I've been in those systems and I know the price you pay to play. So yeah, it's a context to awareness. It's an understanding of that this is normal, but it's also an understanding that until we really have the capability to honor who we are until we have the capability as leaders and individuals to show up in a way that's authentic and imperfect we don't feel like we belong anywhere that's yeah. what the research you're not going to you are a mirage i know we've spoken about this you know that i have been in ex that exact situation of not being able to be pick and choosy and just fit in yeah. and do the work and feed my family and have a job you know being new yeah. to a country yeah. and all of that but one yeah. thing that you highlighted in being true you know in the beginning of the book is the stress of surface acting and i do feel very strongly about that from a personal mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. And also what I see my clients do in order to fit in. And this is why I think career planning and designing is so important. Because if you are in that situation where you're, you feel like your surface acting for quite a while, you don't want to continue to do that. You need to have the stepping stones in place to move yourself out of that situation that can cause so much damage and injury. So we're going to talk about injury in a minute, but can you explain to the listeners what stress of surface acting is? Because I really enjoyed yeah. reading about it. Yeah, I'm really glad that part of the book resonates because it's this hidden cost, right? That the toll we pay for fitting in, conforming, but it's an invisible toll. Often we're not even aware. And I talk about it as like this second job that we have. We have our first job, which is hard. Then we have mm -hmm. our second job of pretending we've got all our SHIT together. Can I swear on your podcast? Yes, <laughs> pretending, you can. <laughs> pretending we have all our shit together when yes. inside it's a different story. So this yes. second job of suppressing, denying, numbing, pushing aside, conquering, shutting up, what did I heard someone said about silencing the inner critic, like this work of suppressing, numbing, disowning parts of ourselves. That's the second job. That's the, the emotional labor of surface acting. When the face we have to put on the world, the grinning and bearing it is not congruent with our inner experience where we just want to scream. Yeah, <laughs> That's an extreme example, of course, but yeah, yes. Yeah, I want is... to make a, sorry to interrupt. I want to make two comments here that I think are important. First of all, the stress of surface acting is not necessarily linked to a job you hate. I read an, an amazing article last year and I sent it to my newsletter subscribers and it was with a woman that had been incredibly stressed from a job she loved. So that's the first thing I think people need to realize as well. And the second thing from personal experience and also working with clients, you don't actually notice the stress and the injuries creeping up on you until you abandon that job or you hit a wall. And then it yes. even takes a few weeks, if not months, for you to look back and think, oh, my good, or for your body and your health to catch up with you, right? So true. I remember I was working in a system that demanded a high degree of surface acting. You towed the party line. You did not question the people in power. You did not 
point out the fact that what we said we stood for was completely the opposite of what was happening. You just yeah. want to point that out. And this company paid really well. I was at a very senior role and I did not realize the toll it was taking. And when I finally left that organization, I'll never forget the moment. I, you know, I was carrying all the tension in body tension, in my shoulders, my neck, I was getting these migraine headaches. I remember I went to my Cairo. It was only three weeks after I left and he said to me, what have you done? Your body is completely different. He didn't even know. He was like, what has happened? Your body is completely different. I was like, yeah, I left that. Well, I hated. Well, I left that organization that wasn't good for me. That's probably yeah. a better way because the job itself was actually really good. I left the organization which demanded the surface acting and he could just feel it in my body within the first five minutes of the treatment. So you're so right. That's impressive. So if you're listening to it later, you can also comment below or send me a note. I'd love to hear from you if what we're talking about today is resonating with you. One of the things that I do a lot in my coaching practice as a career coach, helping people find jobs is dealing with injuries, which is one of the things that you address in your new book, Being True, and how important it is for you to address those injuries and understand them and have that self-awareness. I made a note in the book that I wanted to discuss with you that what you wrote in this book will help me explain to my clients the importance of understanding what the injuries are for you right now at this point in time before you move on to another role. Not just because it's good for you, which is your point. I get it, Cassie. <laughs> but from a performance <laughs> level at the recruitment and selection process, it can negatively impact your ability to get another job if you don't understand it. Because there is something about the injuries in you that even if you're not showing them or talking about them, somehow it's reflected on your body language and how you talk about your past roles and how you talk about your future career opportunities. Your pitch is just not right. And nobody can put a finger on it, on why you weren't selected. This is so true. I've never thought about that. But how many times do you have friends or coaching clients who don't get a job, who haven't done that work, aren't congruent? I call this congruence between what I'm saying and who I know I am at my core because I've done all this work to tend to my injuries. Therefore, we have this congruence. And then they get this really vague feedback. And I've never connected the dots between that vague feedback that's really hard to coach around and yeah. this lack of congruence of this energy I mean I don't want to get all woo woo but it is like an energetic sense we get from someone who's done the work who yeah. knows who they are and yeah. stands grounded in that sense of self yeah I've never thought of it that way but I think you're spot on yeah it happens a lot my role as a coach is to be very much like a tennis coach. I know everybody's tired of listening to me talking about tennis. Apologies if you're following me. That's all I talk about. But I'm there sitting at the box watching you play. And then before and after the game, I will give you advice on the things you need to improve, how you were in relation to your competitor. And, you know, my people, my clients are very good right? So they are at that 80%. In order for us to reach the next 20% and make them super excellent and highly employable, it's sophisticated advice. It requires very much that self-awareness, that vulnerability to accept a little bit of tweaking when you are already so good. And it's usually at the tail end of the process where things get complicated. Yesterday, I was with recruiters in the city. I had several catch-ups and one of them said something to me and I wanted to sort of say my piece, but we moved on and I, you know, I hope she's listening now. You know who you are. He said you something are. That, that I hear all the time and, and I hear other coaches say it too. You know, if you're at the tail end and you're going through all of the process and it's between you and another person, this is great news for you. It's just a matter of time. But what happens to some of my clients, because we've cleared all the other qualifying processes, the job application is perfect, the phone screen is great, the first interview is great, the second interview is great, and then at the tail end, they don't get chosen. So when I reach that point, you know, then it's really 
sophisticated advice. It's about embracing your vulnerabilities, about understanding what is it that is the impediment. And look, it could be environmental. It could be a bias and we address it. If there's an elephant in the room at the tail and we address it right at the beginning at the next time and we, we move on with that. But sometimes I think it's that something that people just can't put their finger on that's holding that candidate back. Yeah. And I, I think you can say it's a matter of time because one of two things will happen. Either they will understand it and learn and convert at that very final step in the future, or, you know, people won't notice and they will move on with that injury. But you know what I mean? It's I know exactly what you mean. And, you know, as you're talking, I've just had an insight. Can I share it about yes. when I did Job, and I think it's because of what you're saying. So I have this part of me, little Miss Achiever, who's who for decades tried to achieve herself her way to worthiness, right? And for her, it was all about proving, competing, you know, being the best she could be. And it's a very solo pursuit, right? And I remember once in my career, an older manager very kindly pulled me aside into a room and he said, Cassie, you know, you don't have to keep trying to prove yourself. It was very kind advice. His name was Jeff. Jeff said, Cassie, you know, you don't have to keep trying to prove yourself. And I, I still remember the inner dialogue I had, which was little Miss Achiever. And she's like, what are you talking about, Jeff? I'm just warming up. <laughs> that was my thought. Right? Yeah. But, but so this proving energy, I think, is a good example because I did go to an interview around that time at a different company. And I actually decided to pull out of the interview process myself because I realized it wasn't quite for me. But the feedback I did get just before that happened was, we're a little bit worried that it's going to be all about you. That was actually what they said to me. Yeah. And they picked up on that proving energy that I was trying to prove myself. And, yes. and their interpretation was, are you really a team player? And at that time, mm. I probably wasn't. Because this proving energy, because a little Miss Achiever, trying to somehow feel like she was enough, was coming through either through my language, probably my language, my tone, what I was talking about. And I've just realized that, it was that proving energy which led to that feedback. Who knows if I would have been given the job off if I'd gone to that final interview. But, uh, yeah, they, they, I remember them saying we're a little bit concerned it's going to be all about you if you got this job. Mm -hmm. And now and what you just said is like, ah, yeah, that was a little Mr. Chiba trying to prove herself. So, of course, yeah, they saw they had x-ray vision into, you know, I have these little bit of x-ray vision into that little part of me that was like trying to prove prove herself. She didn't really yeah. believe that she was enough. But that's so hard, you know, like I think it's part of our evolutionary makeup to care about what the people think and to prove ourselves as worthy of that community, right? I mean, our brains have stopped evolving or they evolve quite slowly compared to where we are in the world today. I was discussing this with my friend and also a great leadership coach, Gary Ryan, yesterday when I met him in town. And I think this is something that you address in your book as well. You know, how do you do that? You know, why should we stop caring so much about proving ourselves? Well, there's a couple of reasons, I think. I'll speak from my own experience, this energy of proving is not is anti-leadership in many ways because it's all about me. It's not inclusive. And, you know, I talk a lot in my leadership programs about the dynamics of linking versus ranking, right? And so right from school, right through society, often the context around it, the systems we're part of are all about ranking. Who's top dog, <laughs> you know? And I spent eight years in GE and they're well known for this. Everyone was actually forced ranked to the bottom 10%. <laughs> The top 10% got to go to Cape Cod, which I, that's what me and the top 10% was so desperate to stay, right? Uh, so it's ranking humans is, yeah. is what the system does, right? That and was so, brutal, wasn't it? Is it still in place? Sorry to interrupt. No, but that was a Welsh. Brutal. That was a Welsh phenomenon and yeah. it was brutal. Uh, well, it was great for me because I got to go to Cape Cod, Barcelona, you, you name it. I got all, all the fancy stuff. I remember eating yeah. lobster on the beach to Cape Cod, you know, in that 10% thing, <laughs> hashtag, <laughs> you know, living the good life. So, yeah, but it was brutal and it took a lot for me to stay there, right, and it came at a very big cost. So, but my point is we're conditioned to want to prove ourselves because the reward seems so great. But I talk about the energy of the striving, the proving, the perfectionism, the ranking, the competitiveness, the combativeness. 
Mm. It's not sustainable, right? It comes, it's very polluting. It's not renewable. It's not sustainable. It's not inclusive. It's all about us. There's this book I read to my kids and it's about the caterpillar pillar. This pillar oh, yeah. of caterpillars that are crawling their way to the top of the caterpillar pillar. No one knows what's at the top. And actually at the top of the caterpillar pillar, the top caterpillar just gets pushed off the pole and plummets to his death. <laughs> <laughs> really dark children's book. And then one day, oh one of the caterpillars in the caterpillar pillar realizes it could be a butterfly and just fly off the pile. <laughs> yes. But it makes total sense to me. And it kind of leads me into this next. Now you probably realize how I've been avoiding you for weeks because I didn't want to talk about it until now. <laughs> but I have this other thing that I want to discuss with you, which is leadership. So imagine a situation where leaders are being appointed based on that reward system like you had at GE, right? That sort of brutal, really sort of competitive scheme. And you wrote in your book, basically the difference between leadership and all the frameworks and the knowledge that has been created around it and the fact that our leaders still suck according to all the research that we have around the world <laughs> saying people yes. want to leave their jobs because they don't like the culture. It's not about well, salary and payment still an issue, but since the beginning of the pandemic, the other part of the percentile that people have always, you know, did, disliked about their work is growing. Mm -hmm. You know, the lack of leadership or the bad leadership, the culture that's not there or is bad. How can we have had so many leadership theories and frameworks and knowledge designed and still have that situation. Because it made people a boatload of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it made people a boatload of money. Here is my 10 capabilities of great leadership. Learn these 10 things and you will be a great leader. By the way, here's my program. That'll be $5 million. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I think part of it was this industrialization of leadership. And to quote myself, if that's not weird, Renata, oh, I yes. go say, ahead. Very meta. Go ahead. There's no <laughs> shortage of how to leadership models. Google how to be a good boss and you'll get almost 2 billion results. If you want to read a book on leadership, you have only over 100,000 titles to choose from. And yet research reveals only 35% of employees feel inspired by a boss. And I reckon it's probably even less than that sometimes. And so, yeah, one of the shortfalls I say in this book is that where a lot of the leadership models are to say to become a good leader, these are the capabilities you must learn. Right. So we're kind of striving to imitate or, you know, to acquire this model of leadership when actually true leadership is about activating what's innate. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the qualities, the best qualities of human nature, the qualities that are innate, the qualities of compassion, creativity, playfulness, connectivity, vitality, courage, I've missed some, but these innate qualities these are the qualities of leadership, right? And, and why I love coaching leaders on this framework is that, you know, the point is not to become a good leader. The point is to become yourself, right? That's a Warren Bennis quote I've borrowed there. But how might you really understand how the very best of human nature is blending and expressing itself through you? Because that's a one of a kind blend and expression, one of a kind. There's no other leader on the planet like you, Renata. There's no other leader on the planet like me because we are unique and it's a very unique way. You know, I think about bottles of essential oils. You know, I have lots of drops of playfulness and lots of drops of vitality, you know, compassion and courage like we all do. But the ratio of that mix is unique. I have my own blend of that. So really it's about reconnecting to that, learning how to activate and amplify that but to do that, we've got to understand all these little parts of ourselves, right, who are blocking access. We've got all these little parts of ourselves, many of whom have lost connection. Like it just keeps going and going. And this is a simplistic model of my inner for those, world. For those of you listening on the podcast later, Cassie's opening <laughs> A babushka and taking lots of little Cassies out of, of the babushka. Well, that yeah, one, you have a mustache. I don't think it's you. Yeah, I'm little Cassies. And so, yeah, if I always say if we chopped ourselves open like a tree, there'd be all these rings of parts, right? All these layers of parts of us. And so and many of these parts have lost connection, lost faith in those 
core quality. So that really is why I'm pioneering this practice of self-fidelity. It's really about the restoration of faith in who we really are, the reconnection and trust in these innate qualities, so that these are the qualities that help us to activate our highest potential. And these are the qualities of true leadership. Yeah. Mm. That's so great. So I now think about your parts all the time. And I was wondering if you would be open to come up with cards. You know how many coaches have cards? I think you need cards. That's my yeah. advice to you now. You know, I love your books because sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, which part of me is annoyed? You know, which part of me is, is you know, not sort of allowing my full self to flourish doing this task. And I can flick through your book and yeah. find yeah. it. But I wish I had a little set of cards with all of the different okay. parts, Kathy. Yeah. That's the next I'll step for you. I'm happy to create <laughs> a set of cards. And there is, I can send a link. There is a beautiful illustrator who works out of the U.S. that has done these beautiful illustrations of parts that you can buy a deck of cards that is beautifully illustrated. So I will share that link and maybe you should check that deck of cards because I feel like that little tool already exists in really incredible illustration. So okay. let me share that and you can share that with your community. I mean, my model of parts I offer up some high level kind of job categories of our inner part, so to speak. I can share these cards. But the thing is, there's this beautiful quote from, do I have the book? It's a beautiful book called A Healing Space. I don't know if you've ever read that. Mac no, Mac I haven't. Beautiful book. And in it, he says, there is a, a map written inside of you in a language that only you can decipher. Mm. And I really love that. So your parts are in Arta are very unique, colourful, intriguing little creatures. And whilst you can relate to some of the parts descriptions, I do really encourage this kind of navigation and this exploration of self and an openness to really unique parts. You know, I've got one coaching client who's got a part that's a little white mouse, for example, that's always foraging for snacks. So when she feels overwhelmed, she'll, she'll reach for these salty, sugary snacks. And she's got this little mouse part that's always at her side, making sure there's always these snacks at hand, which she knows is not good for her. So she really relates to a little white mouse. She's got a part that's like a boxer. I'm coaching a CEO and his whole identity for his whole career has been this fierce warrior, but he's discovered this little boy inside of him with a dinky plastic shield and a dinky sword, you know, and so that he's like this little kind of childlike boy that's trying to protect and fight but is not equipped to do it. So, so what I'm trying to say is, I'm glad my model helped keep getting to know your parts in a way that makes sense to you. And they can be, you know, try to be really creative and open about what these parts feel like for me. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very good advice because when people are looking for work, let's say they're unemployed and they're looking for work, there is this sense that of urgency of looking, finding something else quickly, then they do find something else. And I'm, talking from experience from people that I that I coach right then we catch up and they say oh I wish I had used that transition time better you know I wish I had done what you told me to do and do a bit of hygiene into my life and self-awareness and understanding in this I believe now that I've been coaching full-time for three and a half years this is why I believe sometimes people ping pong or boomerang in and out of an organization. So they find their next job yeah. very quickly and it's a complete misfit. And the yeah. little bit of insight that they had in during that transition makes them really aware very quickly that mm -hmm. it's not going to work. So or, or something horrible happens, you know, and it really is a complete disaster and then they are out again. So if you're listening and if you're looking for work, one of the things that I have been saying to people is it's very likely it's okay for you to be without a job. If yeah. It's yeah. very likely you're going to be fine yeah. for longer yeah. than you think. Yes, right, because we we like to catastrophize that and often mm -hmm. with a few pointed coaching questions, which I know you're a master at, we quickly realize it's actually not about true 
financial crisis here. It's more about this loss of identity. Who the heck am I if I'm not the highly paid executive, right? And I've been through that loss of identity and the re-understanding of self, reimagining of self, right? So often it's not about, you know, can you not go six months if you cut back with the savings that you've got? It's actually, if people are being honest, it's this loss of identity, that work-related identity. And as you were talking earlier about, we have these parts of us that are so eager to conform and, and jump through all the burning hoops to get that job, often driven by this fear of loss of identity in many cases. The reality, we know that if you have to pretend in a job interview, you're going to have to do a really good job of pretending once you get in there. If you're pretending to be something you're not or, you know, pretending to have congruence with values that don't really harmonize with your own values, for example, or working with people who you know are not really coming from a place of serving the greatest good. Once you get in, then then it's like, oh gosh, now I've actually got to keep this pretense up. And that's when it, when the toll really hits, right? So yeah. I think um, it's easy to forget that people think, oh, I just need to get the job and it will be okay. But no, you, you've got to keep up the facade. You've got to keep wearing those masks and armor and that they're heavy and they take its toll as we talked about. And yeah, often it is this loss of identity. Well, if I'm not that high achieving executive, who the heck am I? And that's that inner work that that often we resist, right? I, I'm really shocked by the amount of leaders I meet who kind of say to me, I never look inside. Oh my and, God, I wasn't going to talk about that now. The reflection oh, time. Yes. So oh. I have a theory, right? Years ago, I was the CEO of a foundation called the John Monash Foundation and it, uh, General Sir John Monash Foundation. And John Monash is a, a hero in Australia, an amazing human being, very much a Renaissance man, many different both strings to his bow. And his great grandson gave me a set of books with his diaries. One thing that made me reflect about what you said about reflection time is this. 100% sure that John Monash was a great general, engineer, and lawyer, and human being because every day he sat down and he wrote in his diary. And that opportunity for him to reflect on the learnings from that day and what he could do better the next day or just, you know, talk about what had happened and, and put pour out his emotions on paper because he was, you know, in the First World War and losing men and, you know, being in very difficult, tough situations all the time when he was in Australia and when he was overseas. Mm. Made a better person. Yeah. And we have lost that. Now, you and I have... Of the privilege of every, I, I don't do it every day, but every week I have to think about something to write on the podcast and I have to reflect on what I've learned from my clients, from my practice, from the job market and put something in writing and, you know, talk about it for 50 minutes or so <laughs> to do a new episode. So it has made me a better coach every time. And a better right. human and a better leader. Yes. Exactly. A better person and I'm much more in tune with what I want, much more focused and crisp and sharp on what I want to achieve for my career, for my life. I don't get distracted as much for things mm -hmm. about things that don't matter to me. And I find it really hard to convince even my clients to dedicate the time to do this practice. You yeah. know, they hire a coach and they want me to sprinkle some fairy dust on them yeah. <laughs> and make them better. And it doesn't happen like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's fully congruent with my experience of, of coaching and working with leaders. And so what's your hypothesis on why people don't want to do that reflection work? Because I've got one. <laughs> I think because when you do it for the first few times, I would say the first month or so, it's bloody hard. Mm. And you are confronted with things and you you write things down, for example, and then they surprise you. You for, you, yeah. you come to realize that something is injuring you. You mentioned injur injuries or something yeah. has really affected you that day. You know, it is quite confronting at the beginning of the practice. And then people put their walls up again because they don't want to feel those emotions. It hurts. 
mm, yeah. over it with time. I, I've learned that, you know, like if, if you're doing a thought leadership piece, this is another thing that people struggle with. I, most of my, all of my clients are brilliant at what they do. They could all be writing about what they do as experts. And they find it really hard to put pen to paper and write a, a, a LinkedIn post, for example. Yeah. Yes. Right. And it's because they fear what other will, other people will think about them. They they fear the reaction. They they may not be the ultimate experts in AI or cybersecurity or marketing or whatever. So they don't feel like they're up to the task. <laughs> Very much like you and I when we started, right? Like you know, oh, am I and really like, a career most, coach? Most people go go to their grave with their best work inside of them, right? There's this great quote that like the graveyard is the most valuable land in the world because it's full of you know books that are never written, ideas that are never shared. You know, yeah. most of the people go to their graves with this stuff because of this belief that I, I have to be the expert. I have to have all the answers. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't handle the criticism. Yeah, it's so sad, right, that leaders aren't using their voice because, gosh, what an amazing platform we have. You know, I do post most mornings on LinkedIn and, you know, by lunchtime I've reached sometimes three, five, ten thousand 10,000 people with, with mm -hmm. these messages. And every time I do that, I think of my grandma who had to retire at the age of 21 when she got married and what she would give to have a voice. And yet we're not taking this opportunity to speak up for what's good and what's right. And it, you can see... <laughs> I'm passionate about this subject. So, yeah. yes, we don't speak up. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've been there and this feeling like if I look within, it's a whole can of worms and if I take the lid off, my life is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the senior leaders I coach who who these striving, proving, perfecting, competing identities have propelled their leadership, it's really, really scary to say, what what do you mean that this is not actually the best way to be as a leader what do you mean that i have to kind of shift energy sources from this coal fire that's been so powerful to a different energy source like that's scary yeah <laughs> and so there's a lot of fear and often i'll say look we don't need to just like open this can of worms and just pour it out on the table here Let, let's just start by taking one worm out <laughs> and having a little look at that one and then we can do the next one. But let's putting the lid back on the can of worms is not a solution. And, you know, I think underneath that fear, my hypothesis is that a lot of us are petrified to look inside. It's really terror because we're scared that by looking inside, our worst fears will be confirmed. And that worst fear is that there's something really wrong with us. Mm. That's the fear underneath it. There's something really fundamentally wrong with me. And if I look inside, that fear will be confirmed. And I think that's why I'm so happy that have written, to my knowledge, the first book that brings the internal family systems model into business because this model changed my life to understand there's not one Cassie. There's all these parts of me and these horrible, nasty thoughts, I think, about myself and others aren't really who, who I really am. That, yeah. the, that these nasty parts and thoughts and urges do not reflect the essence of who I am. They're actually parts of me that have lost their way that just need my leadership and care. And and to me, that's the missing piece, right? When when I start to explain to leaders this new understanding of self, mm -hmm. um, because I think that fear there's something wrong with me comes from these nasty, constant judgmental horrible thoughts we all have right about our kids our partners our colleagues ourselves and people you think if people re if there was a megaphone attached to my head right now and what was going through my head was blasting I, I would be locked up friendless homeless like and so I think there's a lot of inner space and courage that comes from just this a new understanding of self, you know, in my book, one of the things I do is redefine self-awareness as this understanding that we're multiple, that we all have multiple parts, and that's a normal, natural, adaptive response to a heartbreaking world, to have many parts, and beneath that part, all those parts, we have a core, and we can lead our parts through a stronger connection to that core. That new understanding of self and new understanding of self-awareness, I think, is a foundation that really gives us the capability and the courage to start to look within. I don't know if you've seen this 
movie or read the book The Luckiest Girl Alive, a movie now on Netflix. And there is this scene, it's a, a very interesting book, partly based on the author's true story, which is heartbreaking, really. But she has that surface acting down to a T. Her internal dialogue is horrible to herself and mostly horrible to the people around her as well. Mm. And there is a scene in the movie, Cassie, where she's confronted with a very stressful situation. And in the movie, you can hear what she says and you can listen to what she's thinking as well. But she accidentally says what she's thinking in front of people. And all of a sudden, that surface acting just disappears and people know what she's thinking about them. And it's really like, wow. <laughs> you know, and that is the situation that I have found can happen in a very different scenario. When you are in a stressful situation at work, for example, all of a sudden it hits a wall. And you then burn out or you burn a bridge. You commit what we call a CLM, a career-limiting move. CLM. Right? <laughs> CLM. <laughs> many CLMs, yeah. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> yes, CLM. because there's just so much that you can take. Well, it's like holding a beach ball underwater, right? Mm. Like when we suppress. Yes. Oh, it's the surface acting. It's like holding a beach ball underwater. Like my hands are shaking for those who are listening. <laughs> For eight, 10 days, hours a day, five days a week, we're holding this beach ball underwater and we're getting more and more shaky, more and more fatigued. And then the beach ball pops up in the most inopportune moments in an exaggerated way. So yeah, that's when we push our parts down, when we don't honor them, we don't understand them, we don't give them what they need. Then yeah, that's exactly what happens. We have these moments where they burst forth and I coached a client once who was a chief people officer and he had this volcano part that had was prone to explosion in board meetings <laughs> and he, he was known to drop the f-bomb slam the door and, and storm out of a board meeting which is a pretty big CLM in capital letters and so he had to work with this volcano part that was erupting and it was really just a little boy who who was treated really badly by his father who just needed his love this this chief people officer to love and care for him in the way that his dad didn't and it didn't take years of therapy. It was a few really precise guided conversations with this little boy who was so petrified of feeling weak. So the volcano was a protector for that injured part that never again said, never again will I feel weak because that was the worst thing in the eyes of his father to be weak and pathetic. And so the volcano part was a protector of that little boy and the volcano had vowed to this chief people officer, never again will you feel weak and, and mm -hmm. will I'll that for you by exploding with rage at any sign of weakness that's my job for you and of course that that was really a career limiting part which continued to make cameo appearances at any sign of weakness so yeah yeah, yeah. Cassie I want to thank you so much for sharing that and I want to end our conversation talking about playfulness and the Ooh. fact that because we're grown up, because that's the other takeaway from this new book of yours, because we're grown up, it doesn't mean that we need to stop being funny and playful and being excited about the world and learning and, you know, mm -hmm. falling down and hurting our knees and getting up again. Where in the world, I mean, we are now in 2023 we can get over the fact that the fact that being adults doesn't mean we get it, we get our shit together all of a sudden. I mean, I'm 51 and I'm still, I still don't have my shit together. And the other thing that I think is great about the exercises that you have and the way that you explain your different parts as babushkas and all of that is gamifying this project for people. It's really interesting, and that's another thing that we haven't spoken about that I think is very aligned between the, our practices is I gamify job hunting. I gamify job application. I know it sounds nerdy, but I like people to follow my games when I'm, you know, teaching them how to apply for jobs. Because if you make it into a game, you have all the clues, you need to move forward, you know, it's fun. It's way more interesting. So I teach that. It's part of my IP. 
and I love it, you know, and I, I get super nerdy about it. Nothing makes me more excited <laughs> than a client playing the game of job applications. <laughs> oh, I love it. And I've never thought of it as gamification, but that's exactly mm -hmm. what it is. And I've been so lucky to have been mentored by Dr. Stuart Brown, who runs the National Institute of Play in the US. And I, I met Dr. Stuart Brown when he came out to Australia to run the Stanford D School from play to innovation and I'm trying to get a schedule of Zoom with Stuart to check in who's he's now in his 90s I believe or late 80s and he really has pioneered this idea of play and then when we are playing we are engaging in the purest expression of who we are and that the road to mastery has to be paved and illuminated through play that's how we learn it's how we connect and so there's so much great theory and evidence around the power of reconnecting to our innate playfulness. I think of, you know, a lot of the leaders I coach, that playfulness is right down to pilot light setting because we've been taught that work is the opposite of play when actually that's a big fat lie. The opposite of play is depression. And mm. we're mistaken about the difference between being childlike and childish. So being childlike and really staying connected with our innate playfulness as a core need and an essential part of leadership is vital, not only to well-being, but to performance, connection, engagement, joy, you name it. It all stems from this. And so, yeah, I, I think certainly the way I approach this idea of being true to ourselves is through this idea of a playful practice, that we hold it lightly. And that's why I use the babushka dolls in my stories about the crazy stuff that goes on in my inner world to really try to bring the sense of lightness and play that this doesn't have to be heavy, hard, slogging, walking through, you know, thick mud. You know, this can actually be a bit of a dance. And I do think often about the dance with my parts, you know, that we are dancing with them and we're, we're trying to form a relationship and take the lead. You know, I was saying to my kids last night that, I've got part of me that after a big day really wants to come home and pour a glass of wine. But now I put a bottle of non-alcoholic sparkling in the fridge and she loves the sound of that cork popping. And I give her a lovely glass of non-alcoholic wine and I dance with her. I give her what she wants, but I set my own boundaries because I know alcohol is not good for me. So that's a small example in my life, how I dance with these parts with playfulness and lightness. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Your book has been lovely to read and play with <laughs> I've had a lot of fun with your exercises and I want to catch up with you in the coming weeks so you can come back to the group coaching program I'm teaching it again starting late this month and I hope to have a master class with you and Absolutely. a different one at that, because I want us to address some of these exercises with the group. Are you keen? Are you game? I am in, and I've got a brand new and improved masterclass that really talks to these exercises. And I would be absolutely delighted to share that with your community. Thank you so much, Cassie. Thank you so much for the talk today. I hope you can understand why I've been avoiding talking to you. I was so excited about having this conversation. Thank you so much to everyone that has been watching. And Cassie, thanks once again. You're a superstar. I love you. Talk again soon. Bye.